Are you on Instagram? If so, then please give Adventure Diaries a follow. The page is at Adventure Diaries underscore underscore or simply search Adventure Diaries Chris Watson and you'll find additional podcast content and adventure content too. So go and add me now on Instagram and I'll see you over there. Thank you. There was a bull hippo who was showing off or I guess they was trying to be very territorial to the the group that he had nearby. Um, and he was following us, you know, he, he'd just be following us and going down, following us and going down. We thought we'd got rid of him. Uh, and as the filming Makoro, I would I'd sort of go ahead, mm. back in the middle. And the bull hippo decided to make a statement. It was like, now, now I'm going to make a statement. And he, um, <laughs> it came, it came at my filming canoe, like, um, you know, in the sort of theme parks where like jaws will come out and come back down again or something like that, you know. It was like that, it was like, Whoa! out came the, the hippo and his mouth was there and I could smell his breath and everything. And uh, so so we, we jumped out. Uh, I remember very vividly filming a, a tree. In, and I'd been, I thought I was comfortable out in, in the Amazon at this point. We were doing, we were going down a, a tributary of the Amazon to take eDNA samples um, and I'd been we've been there for, for a while now and I was feeling quite comfortable and so I thought okay guys I know what I'm doing I'm just gonna I'm just gonna um, I'm gonna I'm gonna film this tree and then I'll be back in a minute and then I, I turned and they'd all gone I was oh. like, that's fine that's fine no, don't worry it's cool it's cool I know where I'm going I'm just gonna follow this track over here and oh no okay that's uh that's that's no nope, that's not the way that's cool because the tree i was just at was here no nope, that's not the way either the tree's gone suddenly you're in impenetrable jungle which everything looks the same and you don't know you don't know where you are <laughs> so you're just like and then you have to do welcome to the adventure diaries podcast where we share tales of adventure connection and exploration from the smallest of creators to the larger-than-life adventurers, we hope their stories inspire you to go create your own extraordinary adventures. And now your host, Chris Watson. Welcome to another episode of the Adventure Diaries. Today, we journey through the lens of Ollie Pemberton. Ollie is an award-winning director and filmmaker with over a decade of experience filming and operating in wild and remote locations across our planet. Through film and photography, Ollie brings to life the stories that are connected to our world places, passionate about placing a spotlight on individuals and organisations that are deeply intertwined with our natural world. Ollie has recently returned from filming and directing season two of Beneath the Baobab with Gordon Buchanan, which documents the complexities and potential solutions of human wildlife conflicts in southern rural Africa. And today we discuss his latest documentary with Aldo Kane that follows the lives of the legendary Bayou Polars who traverse the Okavango Delta in their Makoro canoes. He's a proud maxman and his love of the outdoors stems from growing up on the Isle of Man and his time spent within the Royal Marine Reserves. All of which has helped Ollie hone his skills to operate in these remote and hostile locations and you'll get a flavour of that today. This is a brilliant episode. So settle in and enjoy this fantastic conversation with Ollie Pemberton. Ollie Pemberton, welcome to the Adventure Diaries. How are you? How's it going, Chris? Yeah, great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, excellent. I've been buzzing, buzzing for this. So thank you so much for your time. Saying before we get started, I, I first discovered your work at the Kendall Mountain Festival, which was around the polars of the Okavango, which is one of the, the films that we want to touch on today. So really excited about this so maybe uh, without can, giving you a full bio introduction at the minute but it's you are a, an award-winning filmmaker but you've recorded in some of the wildest and remotest parts of this world haven't you with a real emphasis I, I think it's safe to see a real emphasis on the people that live and work and con con conservation efforts w within these areas and yeah the, the work that you've done with Aldo Kane at the polls of the Okavango recently with Gordon Buchanan the, beneath the Baobab and some of your work in Kilimanjaro is kind of what I want to touch on. But 
to bring it back, safe to say that you're a, a proud Manxman from the Isle of Man. So is that where your love for the outdoors and nature and wildlife came from? Yes, I am a proud Manxie indeed. Yeah, I, I would say so. I grew up on the Isle of Man and I would say the love for it was a really amazing place to nurture the love for the outdoors it's for those who haven't been I always sort of describe it as if Scotland and Cornwall had a love child and it was like put in the middle of the Irish Sea it's I, I it's just such a stunning place to to grow up you're very safe and the, there is just such incredible natural beauty there you know every time I go back especially in the summertime when you get into the water as well. You're just blown away by the the richness of the marine life around there. And it's very well protected. I'm quite proud of what the Isle of Man is doing for its natural world. So yeah, it, is a, it is a good spot to kind of nurture any wildlife nerds like myself that sort of just kind of cra- craved that sort of outdoors. Yeah. Yeah. What, so what, g- growing up then, did you... Were you very much an outdoors person? Did, we, did you do a lot of stuff in the kind of coastal areas in the Isle of Man with it being an island, so spend much time in the water? Yeah, lots of time sort of kayaking and sort of more yeah, fishing. More recently, more foraging is, is a lovely thing to do there. Cause there's loads of diversity of amazing things to forage on the coastline. But yeah, it's just it's just kind of a pretty outdoor. But if you don't like the outdoors, there's not a huge amount to do there because you're not there for the nightlife, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but no, it's, it, is, it is wonderful. And it's got, they've got that richness of the outdoors, but then mixed with deep heritage history, you know, Manx Gaelic speaking, and that kind of Viking Celtic mix. It's a bit like being in Middle Earth, you know, but it's great. I love yeah. it. So you're based in Bristol now, is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Based down in Bristol. It's good. Yeah. That's that's the base anyway when you're sort of hopping about. But yeah, no, I did escape the aisle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, th- I think I read something or a fact, I've seen it on your website that because you're, your website four horn productions based on a four horned sheep is that right <laughs> yeah that's another nod to back home so basically yeah. we've got just to add to the madness of the isle of man wildlife itself is just incredibly unique and you've got obviously you might have heard of the manx cat with no tail we've also got four horned sheep called loxen sheep which are endemic to the isle of man and they've got this sort of huge great big scimitar horns that come out and then curl around the corner so i called it four horn productions as a kind of nod to back home you know little subtle nod yeah i'd never heard of it and when i was doing the research i kind of i went down the rabbit hole with it a, a little bit and it, yeah, it's quite an odd looking With thing, but... sheep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah they're all really... <laughs> They scare a lot of people, thinking they look a bit demonic looking. But I tell you, they're very tasty as well. <laughs> oh, <laughs> really? Delicious. delicious. Yeah. yeah, yeah, very, very good stew on sheep. Yeah, um, fantastic. Yeah, probably should say that wildlife for a maker. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> Christ. So, so, so kind of rolling back a little bit. So, in terms of what we want to cover today and what people can expect, and what I kind of hope to get out of it as well as a little bit uh, selfishness is to, to kind of talk to your career really and really understand how you got into filmmaking what your creative process is and then we'll touch on what well, i'd like to touch on three of your notable projects the ingumu the, the story of the women in kilimanjaro poles of the okavango and the living with the tuskers i think i've got that right mm-hmm. they're living in the land yes. of tuskers yeah so, so yeah so how did you get into filmmaking so, yeah, it, again, it, launching from that sort of nurtured love from the out, outdoors and the Isle of Man, it was with that background, you, it, was, it was the classic. It was watching the wildlife documentaries, the Attenboroughs, and it was at the end of those, the behind the scenes. When I was a young lad, I was just like, that is what I want to be doing. You know, I really want to give that a crack. You don't get people from careers fairs coming around saying you can do that you know when you're at school no one's saying this is a viable career so it was sort of you just have in the back of your mind that you want to do that and you go through school and I went to uni and sort of things like this sort of ticking over but that that's sort of never left and then when I left u- uni I was up in Edinburgh it it, it was sort of a, a moment where it was like all right now was the time to to go full steam ahead and try and make this into a career but I had no 
um, qualifications, so background, no, no skills. So it was either sort of go back to uni and, and, and learn again, but I didn't have any money to do that. So, and you know, I just sort of finished uni and then it was, or, or, or go traveling and make films that I had no skills there and no one would want to see because I didn't know what I was doing. So it was a case of just building up and I just was very self-taught from a while back. And I joined the, the process of getting to where I am now. was It's, a, it's quite a, a long one, but I sort of made it up as I went along. And I joined the through my degree in archaeology, ancient history, Archimedes Persian. I got a job in the RGS in London to help setting up expedition logistics in the Middle East, which was quite cool. But again, just sort of not really, just sort of going into that world was awesome. And I really enjoyed sort of growing from that. And every time I, then I joined another company that set up expedition logistics and things like that. So every time I went out to these cool places, and that was kind of half the battle was, you know, in the back of the mind, I really wanted to go out into these locations, get into the thick of it. I just brought a camera along with me. And I just would film stuff. It'd be that weirdo with the camera, like talking to the local operators, you know, to, you know, in these environments up in the Arctic mainly is where I was. And then I would just film stuff without people asking, just so I'd say this could be good for maybe social stuff or maybe socials didn't really exist then. <laughs> but it was more just promotional stuff. And then I did night school. I taught, you know, got a bit better with the equipment. I then joined the Royal Marines Reserve for a few years just to sort of get more proficient in the outdoors. It's just like building up all these skills and it just sort of grew from there, I suppose. You, you get better equipment, you get better in your understanding of these remote places and the people that operate in it and you just sort of grow and grow and it sort of has brought me along to where we are today, I guess. <clears throat> what was your first, can you recall, your first ever trip away with the RGS or any expedition? What was that like? Did the, no, I, I didn't. I, I spent more time in the map rooms with the RGS, to be fair, which is quite fun. But I remember the first film that I ever, the first kind of thing I ever shot was way back when. It was it was dog sledding. It was like a eight eight day dog sledding thing in, in Finland in this Panjärvi National Park. Palas Ulas, that's it. Sorry, that's in Russian. And it was sort of just with the local guys going through this Arctic kind of tundra stuff. And it was with a little flip cam, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> really the wrong piece of equipment now, but you got, you do have to start somewhere. And I think if you've got that sort of drive, it seemed ridiculous. I had this job that was sort of enabling me to just learn as, as I went. And it's, it was, it's just a, it was a fun ride, you know, whilst you're learning how to, you know, be efficient, proficient in, in minus 25 conditions and stuff, yeah. you know, from that range and, the more stuff you do, the more equipment you get. And then it's just about being really on it with battery life. And, you know, you're sort of shoving batteries into your armpits, keeping them warm, you know, all this kind of mad stuff. <laughs> Sleeping with them all in your ruck, in, in your sleeping bag. So it's like kind of, I described kind of just pouring a ton of Lego into a duvet and sleeping in that's kind of what it felt like. <laughs> yeah. uh, can I, interestingly, I done that same dog sledding trip in the Arctic in Finland as well. It's, it was phenomenal. Oh, that's cool, was isn't two, it? Two, two, two years ago, yeah. Did um, you play Arctic golf? <laughs> no, no, I don't know. We, the, like, we didn't. Local, lad, the local lads call it Arctic golf, where you get the frozen dog poop and you stuff ah, it okay. with a shovel. No, I mean, it, I mean, you talk about cold, that was bitterly cold. I think it went down to minus 40 at one point when we were there and... The speed that these dogs go at was incredible. I wasn't quite, even with the brake going, they were still like pulling us along. It took us a while to actually get them to kind of stop. So that was a great, great experience. I'd love to go back and do it again. Yeah, they're amazing things. You just don't, you just don't want to be, you want to be dry, you don't, you want to be driving it, don't you? You don't want to be down. Yeah. At, ah, exactly. And sort of bum, bum level. It's quite yeah. smelly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, fantastic. So technology must have changed a fair bit then when, since when you started. You talk about flip phones and stuff. And how is how does that... Mm. Do, oh, sorry, let me rephrase that. I mean, in terms of the, your maturity as a filmmaker and with technology, how do you look back on those times compared to the work, the phenomenal work that you're producing at the minute? We'll be back after a quick break. Are you on Instagram? 
If so, then please give Adventure Diaries a follow. The page is at Adventure Diaries underscore underscore or simply search Adventure Diaries Chris Watson and you'll find additional podcast content and adventure content too. So go and add me now on Instagram and I'll see you over there. Thank you. Oh, I, I think they're, they're key, those times. I think if you can get comfortable with and try and produce stuff, this is just my, my interpretation because obviously there are so many ways to do this career, so many incredible filmmakers who, who I know have done different routes, you know. So there is no one way, but I guess my process, I, I look back on those days with such great fondness because if you can learn to make something from pretty much nothing you know you've got minimal tools and if you can try and pull it together it's about weaving the story like taking looking at the landscape that you're in and just being like this is so incredible how how do i try and capture this you know how do i make this scene more what can i do what can i do more and you know if you can try and produce that on minimal equipment i would almost encourage people to go back to basics and start with basic because if you're just taking all this new really expensive equipment that we all use now for broadcast stuff obviously that fast tracks you into you might miss out on the process part which was yeah really quite fun as Mm. well that's the thing how do you approach the the stories ollie do do you like storyboard have an idea in mind or because i imagine you know, you you just have to deal with what you deal with when you get to these places a lot of the time. How, how do you approach that in terms of trying to capture that, that story? Yeah, no, a, a lot of it, a lot of it is storyboarded before. And they, they, there's a mixture of the two, you know, you, you do go out with an idea, but then when you are in the remote locations of our planet, you there are lots of things that you just cannot plan for. So it's about just seeing it and going, let's, run with this i didn't plan that snow leopard was going to turn up at this time or whatever you hope to see it but you know that there, there it is and i think that's the sort of base as it were and the stories that i tell or i guess the passion that i've kind of developed of you know i've done some very cool stuff i've got like i'm very lucky with or fortunate with what i do i love what i do and you know it's taken me some amazing locations which do need the skills i suppose to 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 thrive in them so if you're filming snow leopards up at altitude in the snow you know you're going to be there for hours on end and you need to be hiking with all your equipment up and down mountains and stuff and if you're in the in jungle expeditions in in the amazon you need to be happy in those hot sweaty environments in doing that over kind of near over a decade now i think that the theme that i got in all of these locations that just really caught me was yes you need to be good at your environment but i learned that you can you just need to always defer to local knowledge and you can't set aside time to recognize the importance of the local teams because if you nine times out of ten these doc, huge big budget documentaries that are filming our wildlife and they're getting into locations you've got local teams who are helping moving people about they've grown up in these regions they've grown up in these areas and i was just always just so blown away by their skills by their connection to the the land that they lived in so it grew into kind of side passion projects that i was like yes i'm doing my main storyboard my main story of this thing but how about they become the main story, you know? How about we actually put a spotlight on these guys? Because, like, we're only now... Do- the, the, the behind the scenes of these things was putting spotlights on the camera teams. You know, these are the behind the scenes. But what about the behind the scenes of the behind the scenes? You know, that's where I got really fascinated with because they're just such deeply interesting people. So, so yeah, it kind of developed in, into that, really, yeah. Yeah, I think that's what's. I mean, I personally really like about some of your your films. You I mean if you look at the likes of like Planet Earth and these big productions and things like that, that they're fantastic. But then you do tend to get that five ten minute part at the end 
where it's about the people and the people behind the camera, whereas I like the flip sides of where it's much more the focus on the people in those environments and how they are you know, living and working and, you know, whether it's human wildlife conflict or whether it's making sure that people can summit Kilimanjaro, for example. So, Yeah, and, and, and often we've created this kind of, uh, and this is something that we've done, is we've created often in these bigger shows this idea of a utopia where humans live separate to wildlife mm -hmm. and you know I watch these wildlife documentaries that are, I, I still love you know and I still absolutely adore them but then often we do create this, this image that for this to happen this beautiful cinematic Attenborough we shouldn't be there the truth of the matter is, is that we, we are here yes we have kind of excuse me French fucked it up yeah <laughs> yeah but we are here so and we're not showing signs of going anywhere so there are people who live alongside these wild the, the wildlife in the wild regions and i think the, these are the people who actually we can learn a huge amount about how to uh, live alongside our wildlife coexist a bit better yeah. So, so yeah it, it it has grown into a real focus onto that and not only showing the skills of the individuals who guide us around these wild regions, but also learning from them of how to coexist. Yeah. On that very point, I think the the film uh, Living in the Land of the Tuskers is quite, is very interesting. So human wildlife conflict. And is it was it Kenya that was filmed in? Yeah, that's in Savo, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. whereby the attitude towards wildlife was quite by the you know the people that lived there because their crops were getting dis dis destroyed you yeah. know they had quite a you know kind of, you know negative attitude towards it but the the film highlights the model whereby what was it, the introduction of fences and it was like 10 percent of the land where they focused on carving off and then cultivating and through that the conflict kind of almost went to zero but their yields and their farming increased like tenfold or something yeah yeah it's, they're, they're really doing amazing things out in Savo and actually I've done a lot of conservation film and, and I've met a lot of incredible conservation like world-class sort of um world knowledge conservation heads around around the planet all doing incredible things but I think what really stuck to me stuck with me about the Savo project is how successful it is and how quickly it has been successful the it is a really tough place to live, Savo, the Savo West, Savo East. It's like one of the biggest areas in, in, in Kenya that is, again, it's pre pretty wild. It has the most, uh, the largest population of elephants in Kenya there. And with it, uh, alongside me, on the fringes live people, and they have done for, for a very long time. So often, and we do see these now, I think there was an episode on the, the latest planet Earth, which touched on, even in Kenya as well, it touched on the human wildlife. Um, I want to say, I want to say challenge because from the recent shoot, which I guess we'll come on to with Gordon Buchanan, I, I, it's an interesting one because if we say conflict, it's a negative thing. It sounds like it is a negative connotation and these wildlife is, yes, they are dangerous, but the overall thing is, is bad. Whereas challenge is probably a better way to to describe it but these guys certainly do have their challenges because previously you know they'd own hectares of land and it's pretty scrub landy it's pretty you know very hard to to get any yield from it and any yield that does pop up you know you have sh any kind of green shoots showing through the kind of dusty brown ground an elephant is straight in they can they can find this immediately so the the difficulty is that these guys who live there they're not able to feed their families and what then subsequently happens and you can totally see it from their perspective is what else do you do you can probably go and end up getting involved in some illegal wildlife trade or perhaps in some poaching aspects or things like that because these things are stopping them eating so you get that. Whereas what Savo Trust and Tafauti, they're two amazing charities who I can give the links at the end. They created the 10% fence plan. And what that does is essentially that they looked at this model where 
they were trying to farm intensively all of their area. So they, they suggested, what if we try and benefit both human and wildlife in this equation? We will provide a fence that is solar powered electric fence that's going to keep out the wildlife, but that's 10% of your land. And that 10%, the rest of your land will be left to follow so that the wildlife can just roam. You know, they don't have to feel that they're in the way of the farmers or the farmers are in the way of them. And they found that if they intensely farm 10% of their land, the yield was hundreds fold. And they were, and since they've just said, it's very sim- simple, small area that is, and then they learn the hydroponics techniques, they learn how to farm in a really like clever way and kind of stack processes. So they're making the most of the small space. That then meant that there's, since then there's been no conflict at all. And in that way, the communities, they view wildlife as they become invested owners in the project rather than just stakeholders, you know, and then they see wildlife as a benefit and everybody wins. And it, that, that's what I loved about that particular project, because it's one that could be utilized, not just in Africa, but around the world. And I think it's, it's such a good one. Yeah, there are so many layers to it. Like I say, I think that the attitude towards the, the wildlife changing as well, the kind of the science of cultivating it and getting more out of it. You know, I think there was a scene with a jerry can and the way that we're getting much more out of the water to irrigate it and stuff. It was yeah. fantastic. Yeah, yeah. yeah really excellent. Uh, it must make you proud though, looking back and stuff like that, eh, to, to see that it's actually making a difference. It's not just a, a, you know education and information. It's actually making a, diff- a difference to these people's yeah. lives. Yeah, no, I, I think what they're doing is in- incredible. I'm proud to work with them and I'm, you know, proud to, I guess, play some very small part in their bigger plan of just telling the story. And, you, and then in doing so, you get to tell the story of one of the individuals who live yeah. in there. Chalo Ndetto is a lovely man and he's absolutely crushing it right now because I had a a chat with Krista Cullen that's a fouty head recently and she showed me pictures of how Charlo's getting on and it's been two and a half years since he's out of the fence and it's very easily maintained a lot of people say look fences fall down it's very easy it's just it's got these porcupine spikes that come out and that's the bit that stops elephants coming but yeah he's planting way more than he ever thought he's created this sort of outhouse he's even going to try and get people to come and stay at his place you know he's turned into a proper advocate and businessman which is wicked <clears throat> fantastic yeah i think just sharing these stories it's incredible to hear and see excellent what so so on the, the kind of same subject then as, as your some of your films so maybe switch in fact switching lanes to ngumu if i'm pronouncing that correctly so yeah. the fantastic women of Kilimanjaro, that's what a story that is. And obviously, did, did you summit? You must have summited Kilimanjaro as well whilst you were filming. Yeah, yeah we. they dragged me up. Yeah, that's mad. Yeah. <laughs> that's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wouldn't have, yeah, definitely. They pulled me up to the top rather than the other yeah. way around. So, yeah. And yeah. these women are carrying, what was it, 25, 30 kilos on their heads a lot of the time? Yeah, yeah. I mean, just incredible. Just the neck. I, I tried it as well. I put it on my head. And I said, yeah, no, it's, it, that, that was, a, again, it was a real pleasure to be part of that project because there's a huge, I guess, going back to, this is less conservation led and it's more back to the skills of individuals who guide people through it. I think this is probably an interesting commercial angle because, and it was f- funded by an adventure travel company, Exodus Travels. They um, wanted to highlight the the porters who take clients up Kilimanjaro. It's a very commercial mountain out of the the seven summits. It's probably the easiest one to do, but still have the altitude factor in. And a lot of people say they they have climbed Kili. They've done Kili, but you know, I, they what they don't often say in the pub is that their bags were carried up by other people. <laughs> And their tents were set up by other people. So we wanted to understand who these people were. So for the documentary, knowing who these individuals were. And then actually it was highlighted that there was a huge gender imbalance on the from a very patriarchal society that it is anyway. The, there was a, a small breakout group of, of amazing women who decided that they wanted to be 
doing what the men were doing because they, they said we carry the same amounts down in the field whilst holding babies whilst you know doing everything times 10 backwards on their, on their heads so so this one lady called loose aka the lioness she really spearheaded the whole thing 10 years ago and turned up at the gates and said i'm coming and they were all terrified by her and <laughs> she, she grew this small collective of incredible women we call, called the film gumu because in the swahili that means tough and that's the kind of local nickname for the porters because they're just tough as nails, they're absolute nails. So yeah, we followed them and hearing their stories of what it was like to break down the, the gender norms and hear their stories and where they are now. But I think the most thing I'm proud of, again, at that project wasn't so much the film, it was more the aftermath of that because the guys who funded it, the Exodus, they have a foundation charity and with them and a local team set up the Mountain Lioness found, uh, Scholarship where for the, I think it was that the aim was to have 30 fully qualified mountain guides um, within three years from the film. So every 10 every year in a space of three years and obviously COVID got in the way of that. But this year they just achieved that. So there are Fantastic. 30 more fully trained quite and it's expensive you can't like if, if they to go from porter to mountain guide you know which is where the big bucks are on the mountain you have to go through a course you have to do all your training you have to speak english you have to know your first aid you have to be really wow. good you know all this stuff that you need to know and if you're where you're going to find the money especially if you're uh, a mum who has you know three kids to look after as well so it, it was really cool to be part of that and having to say there's 30 more fully trained, you know, they went, they got put through all of that education, all of the English training. Then it, yeah, there's, there's now 30 more fully trained guys, which is really cool. It's amazing. And it looks like they're having loads of fun. I know it's only a short video, but it looks like they were having loads of fun singing and dancing and, and all yeah. that on the way up as well. Oh, the morale is amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's always good morale going up the mountain. Less so for me when I'm carrying all of the filming equipment. <laughs> I'm trying to walk backwards up it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so how long was the, the climb then on that? Is it like five, six days, Kilimanjaro? Yeah, I think it was about, it was about five days. Yeah. You sort of, you, you just break it down so you can acclimatise a bit better. But yeah, I had the joys of having to film film everyone walking towards me. So I would have to walk backwards yeah. up with all the kit. And then just tripping over the amount of B-roll footage of me just going backwards. <laughs> yeah. Was that tricky at all, dealing with the altitude and trying to get your shots in, and when, especially when you got to the summit? Because I, I, I think to summit, you need to get up quite early in the morning, don't you, to, to see the sunrise yeah. or the night before and stuff? You get up the night, yeah, you sort of get up at two in the morning, I think, and then you... Yeah. Schlep up. The main pr problem I had, it wasn't, I wasn't too bad, luckily, but the main problem I had was the drone wouldn't take off on the top. And uh, the altitude was playing up with the rotors, and I was just swearing at it. I was like, <laughs> I carried it. This is when drones were a lot bigger. This film was like a, a few years ago now. So uh, they didn't have the smaller drones when I was shooting this. It was sort of the bigger phantom ones, and I had to lug this great big thing up. And yeah, I was, you know, <laughs> felt like something like Monty Python, like hitting it and <laughs> shouting at it, wearing at it. And then, and then to, took off when I got the shot. I was like, oh, oh yeah. I swear at inanimate objects. Oh, yeah. Did you see the sunrise when you got up there? Or... Yeah. yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Oh, Incredible. Yeah. yeah. Really cool. Fantastic. Just, can I, on that about the, you know, the women breaking down the stigmas and really kind of making a, you know, a livelihood for themselves. It's fantastic. It reminds me I had a guest on in season one, Jan Backer, and he does a lot of trekking in the Pamirs. And he was championing, it was women rocking Pamirs, and it was female guides that are kind of doing something a little bit similar in the Pamir region, which is fantastic. It's, it's mad yeah. that it's, these types of things are only happening in this day and age. You know, at least it's a positive, can't come any sooner. Yeah, and it's, and it's about, no, I, I agree. It's, it's about allowing the platform for for this to, to, to be heard, for their stories to be heard. And that's kind yeah. of the important thing. Thanks. Exactly. So switching lanes then into, you know, the, the main 
movie that I really wanted to, to kind of talk about, which absolutely captivated me when I went to Kendall, was Polars of the Okavango with Aldo Kane. And what I think he says at the start, it's probably the wildest place on earth or something. <laughs> what, what was that like? Yeah, that really, and it was great to talk about it just now on the Kendall tour. They, they have a, a tour that's going around. I was able to reshare it in Bristol and in, a, in an Oxford. I, I just love, selfishly, I love doing that because it transports you back to the Okavango, which is just, I think, one of the wildest places that I've, I've been to. It's just on the aspect of there's so much life there. You know, you've got the Kalahari Desert, and then in the middle of that is this Okavango River Delta that comes in and just life just pops out from the sand. And obviously from that, wildlife from all around will naturally navigate towards that. And you've just, everything is on steroids in terms of the sound and the sights. You know, it's like being in Dolby surround sound all the time, you know, yeah. just it's, everything's alive, you know, there's just the noises, the smells the whole lot. So yeah, we, again, a bit sort of on the theme of appreciating the the local teams. I think that, that if you're a wildlife fan, Okavango is high on the list. You know, it's somewhere that you will hope to get to in your life, you know, at some point and pe- people will sort of, that's a sort of Shangri-La of like wildlife excursions because of the amount, the abundance of wildlife still there now. You know, you can not find a human in a day and a half in any direction in some days. So, but it is dangerous in the sense that, you know, there is a lot of crocs and a lot of hippos. So to really make the most of the Okavango, you would want to go into a Makoro, which is the the local transport. The guys who live on the Delta, the Baye, they will travel around in a Makoro canoe, which is kind of hewn out of an old sausage tree. And now subsequently it's fiberglass, but... I'll go into that. And if you're there as a wildlife enthusiast, you can sit back and enjoy and take snaps of the wildlife because they're they're ferrying you around this area. But if you didn't know, if you didn't know any better, you know, you'd be going down the wrong channel, you'd be going down the wrong way, and immediately you'd be running into the, the sharp end of something teethy or <laughs> so it was about trying to show people their skills get people appreciating that when they go there these guys are just so much more than just water taxis you know they're not just guys who are going to ferry you around they're guys who have lived there and they've understood the the wildlife so intricately in so much detail and aldo as you've talked about you know if for those who don't know aldo kane he's one of the world's for, foremost safety experts on a lot of these big expeditions that have, have taken place over the last few years. And if there is a big expedition documentary, you're probably nine times out of 10 out those in the background falling it out. So it seemed like a really great marry up here to kind of take someone who does that for a job and put him in an alien job and understand, and learn from people who do this as their job as well. You know, so it's kind of in from different parts of the world, but to truly understand the Baye and, and their skills, we travelled the entire o- Okavango Delta with the Baye from top to bottom, panhandle to the buffalo fence. So that was just under 300 kilometres. Well, yeah, that's um, Yeah, so it was it was amazing, yeah. yeah. And in these little Makoros, I think I recall that you traversed the entire length of it without a map or GPS, these guys done this by yeah. imprint, didn't they? Well, and the landscape changes a little bit, doesn't it, each year, depending on you know the level of water and the way that it traverses the landscape. That must have been pretty something. Yeah, yeah no, I mean, it's just, um, the, there was one guy, so the, the head polar was called C Company. Charlie Company was his name. It's just sort of nickname, but it was sort of taken on as his, his actual name. So we called him CK. Uh, was his nickname as well. So he was in charge of the whole thing. He was the only one of the group who had traversed the entire Delta before. Everyone else was obviously grew up on the Delta, but they'd never done the whole thing. So they were learning from him. And yeah, the whole thing was done without GPS, without any modern technologies. It was just a pleasure to watch. You know, he would see the, the, he, he, 
pick way markers from from the the, the trees. He'd know know the, the landscape, and obviously the, this changes as you say every year from fires, elephants coming through, changing the landscape. So he's having to update his sort of mental GPS. But he knew how to follow the right channel. He would sort of he would say sometimes that the smell of this particular river is going to lead us the right way. And I just didn't quite wow. understand that, but it was just in, in the way that the water would channel and they would do. And then obviously for the other navigational points of like getting the other guys through, they would snap like little tiny, like sometimes you're going through reeds that are like eight feet tall, you know, and, and you'd lose them a coro, you know, the polar, you just, you wouldn't be able to see them anymore. So they'd be snapping bits of, twigs and reeds and you'd have to follow that and i i wouldn't have a clue yeah. what to do and i had a similar i just re- remembered another story but it was sort of not in the Okavango, but i had a very similar thing in the amazon on an expedition we did there where again just the importance of local guys mm. and and that very thing so just start snapping tiny bits of leaves in the amazon but without those guys i remember very vividly filming a tree and I've been, I thought I was comfortable out in the Amazon at this point. We were doing, we were going down a tributary of the Amazon to take eDNA sample. And I'd been, we'd been there for, for a while now and I was feeling quite comfortable. And so I thought, okay, guys, I know what I'm doing. I'm just going to, I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm going to film this tree and then I'll be back in a minute. And then I, I turned and they'd all gone. I was oh. like, that's fine. That's fine. No, don't worry. It's cool. It's cool. I know where I'm going. I'm just going to follow this track over here. And, oh, no, okay, that's, that's, no, that's not the way. But that's cool, because the tree I was just at was here. No, that's not the way either the tree's gone. Suddenly, you're in impenetrable jungle, which everything looks the same, and you don't know, you don't know where you are. <laughs> you just like, and then you have to do, you have to do, yeah, it's the equivalent of putting up the barriers in the bowling alleys. You have to do the bit that you just really didn't want to do, which is uh, <laughs> just blow the whistle. <laughs> I was going to say, what did it say? It's called, but is it a whistle? <laughs> yeah, because if you don't have a, I mean, yeah, if you don't have a whistle, you know, people, uh, just so that they can find you. And then they're just like, boop, hello. <laughs> exactly. well, again, that's just, a, that just, the snapping reminded me of, again, just, you can be comfortable in your environment as a document, you know, as a sort of wildlife expedition filmmaker but again without those guys I'd, I'd probably still be out in the amazon now anyway <laughs> so so was that with were, were they literally just like snapping like a twig or just eating people little markers yeah, yeah wow. just little, little way markers especially yeah. in the Okavango, they're just bending the reeds wow. a certain way and i could I, I i would put that down like oh that that reed snapped a little bit but no that's <laughs> it, like sign cut wow. so they do all these little details and they're always looking out for hippos and crocs yeah. you know everywhere yeah. Is, yeah on that you had to get into the water to film at times didn't you were you shitting yourself <laughs> <laughs> there was uh i only did that once yeah i was i was L- luckily the water was brown anyway so it was fine <laughs> Yeah, there was there was one, one time where I did have to film. I really wanted a shot of Aldo coming down in this beautiful sunlight, but I wanted it to be on the the, the level of the the water surface. So I again look into the guides, being like, "Is this all right?" And they were like, "Yeah, I guess so." I was like, "Okay, I was in there." Yeah, I, I wasn't in there long because we were we'd seen a lot of hippos and crocs along the way, um, but we did actually get chased out. I was going to say, there's a scene. There's a scene where you kind of drop the camera a little bit, and it's and then Aldo cuts to asking if you're okay. It sounds like you're being charged or chased or something by a hippo. <laughs> yeah. So there's there was this the standard procedure that they the guy said to us um, before we set off was should now there's going to be a lot of hippos and crocs on this trip <laughs> because where we're going there's nothing, there's no one, especially in the north. There's a lot of I guess it's more kind of lagoon, broken up into lagoons and deeper ones. So there's going to be more hippos and crocs there, I suppose. And they just said, look, I mean, if you do get into a, a, a run-in with a hippo, if a hippo comes at you, because you're always polling in the slightly lower, the shallower parts of, so you can dig in and, and punt off. You're not ever going to really be in the, what they call the black water, which is the deep water. So they said, if ever a hippo comes at you, what 
your standard procedure is, and this was like having the kind of safety chat of, you know, exits are here, the safety belt is here. The whistle was not going to help you. <laughs> this, is, this is the Okavango version, which means you jump out into the shallow bit and you push the Makoro into the mouth of the hippo and, and off you go. And I was like, oh, good. Yeah, great, great, great. Don't ask to fly, fly. I'm glad I won't need to do that. But I did. We had to, we were polling through, I think it was day four. And it was this area that they knew was really hot on hippo numbers. And I love hippos and crocs. I think they're, I just want to get that in. I think they're just like incredible animals. And I love studying them and I think their movement's fascinating but you know I've not grown up on the Okavango and I think they obviously view them as slightly they still respect them massively but then it's in a different well that I'm looking at it in a sort of rose tinted aren't they sentient beasts and then when you're actually up close with them you're like okay I see why they can be a problem yeah. so this was day four and we were going really slowly through the, the lagoons and you there's a procedure they do every lagoon you go in hippos hold their breath for six minutes around six or seven minutes so you tentatively go in and you come through the reeds and you see the water there the lagoon there you're scanning for tiny little bubbles that would be coming up and again to the point where it could just be a bit of oxygen coming from the ground i had i couldn't tell the difference really i'd be like is that a hippo they'd be like no is that a hippo? No. Why a hippo? No. What about that? Yeah. Oh, okay. No, I'm joking. And like, oh. So, but yeah, they, they would go in and then they would look around and then wait for six minutes. If nothing comes up, you're safe. You're good to go. That's why you have to wait because you don't want to be under, you don't want a hippo underneath you as it comes up, basically. <laughs> so we covered barely any distance on that day because of the amount of the goons and the amount of times we had to stop, start, stop, start, stop, start. And we thought we'd broken the back of it. We'd, we, it was quite an exhausting long day and we come to nearly the end and everyone, this is, this, this is the part where you start to, you know, you're tired and you, you start to kind of maybe switch off a little bit. There was a bull hippo who was showing off, or I guess they was trying to be very territorial to the group that he had nearby. And he was following us, you know, he would just be following us and going down, following us and going down. We thought we'd got rid of him. There's a scene in the film where Aldo's literally, that, there he is, he pops up. And as the filming Makoro, I would float around everyone's Makoro. I would sort of go ahead, back, in the middle, while everyone was going. And at this point, I was at the back, and the bull hippo decided to make a statement it was like now i'm going to make a statement now i'm going to you know show off to the gals around the corner and he came at my filming canoe you know in the sort of theme parks where jaws all come out and then slowly come back down again or something like that you know it was like that it was like Whoa, out came the, the hippo and his mouth was there i could smell his breath and everything and uh so so we jumped out and into the shallows and it was up to, up to your waist um, like running inside the Blair Witch and uh, luckily he was you know it all sounds very dramatic but luckily he was just making a statement he wasn't actually out to, to cause damage so yeah we got away but yeah we were as Aldo puts it pretty wrung out yeah. <laughs> I can imagine I can well, imagine yeah yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's I mean that's what an experience but Christ that yeah that's pretty it's pretty terrifying uh, <laughs> Wow. What was it like when you were camping at night? Because I seen that he was camping on a little island then. So, you know, how did you deal with the threat of wildlife and stuff at so, that point? Yeah, the, again, like uh, it, all, all these local kind of tricks, again, like sort of going back to learning from them is that your, your procedure is that you get to, and there are thousands of islands, mm. you know, and they always wanted to be there before sunset because a lot of the animals, Animals are most active around that time, a lot of crepuscular, uh -huh. larger animals being quite active around this time. So they, we didn't want to be out on the water then. So we'd find one of the islands and often some of them had never been trodden on by humans, which was such a cool thing to think. But you pull up all your kit and the first thing you do is do a little recce around the 
the island just to make sure there's nothing bitey in the bushes where it spans. <laughs> so you're shouting, you're clapping, you're moving around. And then you set up your your tents. But again, making sure that you're not on a hippo track. Oh. I definitely put mine on a hippo track and then they were like, no, move it. <laughs> you, you're my wife. So, okay. And then they light a fire and it's fine. To be honest, in the night, like once you're in your tents, like you're not viewed as a threat or anything. And it's just, yeah. it's, and there's a fire going, you know, they've got a fire that sort of creates a bit of smoke. And KB, who was the, probably the strongest polar out of the group, he was a absolute locomotive train of a snorer. So like, I mean, <laughs> nothing, everything would have been off by him. Because, I mean, he sounded, I generally thought there was a lion. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, my point, but it was KB snoring. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God. Mm. But no, that, that's the time that I, you know, I'd be running around like a lunatic filming because yeah. it's such beautiful light. And I love, there, there was one, one day, that particular day, the campsite before we he- head off for the hippo bit, there was this amazing island and I was getting these shots. And I, I then saw this, because again, that, that thought of this, no, possibly no one has ever seen this view. And you just take a moment and you're like, this, this is fresh for me. You know, this is me being selfish, but take a moment. This sunset, this area, this is just, this is my moment sort of thing. And then even, even then I was like, you know, started to look at the birds flying around and you're really in tune. You sort of start to really switching on to the area. And then I saw this incredible murmuration birds just kind of moving around and i was like oh wow and i got my binoculars out and i went back to the, the camp like close to the guys i was like guys look at that i was like looking at them they looked to me quite funny i was like what i said like, look at the birds They're amazing wow and then i had then it basically transpired it was that kind of father ted moment of these cows are near these cows are far away <laughs> Uh, where actually it wasn't birds at all. It was a big swarm of mosquitoes wow. moving around about five meters away from my face. Wow. <laughs> I was like, oh. yeah. tiredness yeah. and that, no doubt. No, that, okay, I, just, I got my depth perception completely yeah. wrong. I don't know why it was the sunset. But I was like, oh my God, that's a lot of mosquitoes. And then they get elephant dung. They liked it. They put it in a, a circle. And it's quite smelly, but it does the job. Yeah. You know? Well, I imagine the soundscape must have been pretty phenomenal as the sun's going down and things are starting to come to life and the, the, oh, the sound must change. Wild. Yeah. It's just electric, you know, yeah. like I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it, you know, just all of those noises coming out at once and then it just sort of quietens down a bit and then KB starts snoring. <laughs> so, so on the topic of like KB, uh, C Company and the Baye in general, it's good to kind of illuminate the good work that you're doing and obviously, you know, tourism very much important to their, their livelihood. So you, mm. Looking back on it, you know, personal experiences aside, Oli, do, are you pleased with how it turned out, the video? That particular film? Yeah. Uh, yeah, very much so. I think the that that was a good example of just suck it and see because once you're on the, the expedition, you can have your storyboards as much as you like, but it's that expedition filming it's it's the unknown it, it, not unknown it's what's around the corner for the film mm-hmm. is, is sometimes unknown so i think i think yeah it's been great that it's been so well received and picked up a bunch of awards which is really cool but i think the, the biggest sort of chuck up is when you hear that it's been resonated to the local guys and they loved it and they loved oh, yeah. the because often that's so important is to make sure that we show the, these films to the guys as well, because it, it, it feels wrong just going and, and having such a sort of, you know, deep connected time with their lives for a small amount of, of time and then just sort of going, bye, thanks. Yeah. Whereas if you can you know, facilitate a kind of field cinema and get them all kind of watching it and stuff. And yeah. if you get their approval and they like it and they think you've, you know, because this is a culture that is not your, your own. And you got to do it so respectfully. you got to do it so carefully. And if they say that's cool, then that for me, there's that's what I'm most proud of. Uh, it, honestly, it's it's fant- it's fantastic, and I'm not just be- I'm not being disingenuous at all. It's, it's a fantastic little movie. I think everything about it, the light, the little bit of drama in it, but bringing these people to life and just the, bringing the wildlife and the areas to to life, it's, it's great, and it thoroughly deserves its awards. Yeah. Oh, thank you. So, Ocavango to to one side. You've, 
been back in Africa, haven't you, with Gordon Buchanan, Benny's the Baobab, yeah. I think season two. Yes. Yeah. That's, that is, I'm pleased to say, that is out today. today. Yes, I know. I, I was about to start listening before this and I thought I'd better get back to get myself sorted for this show, but I'll, I'll be listening to that afterwards. So how was that experience? Yeah, that was fun. That was fantastic. And yeah, as I said, I'm really pleased that's come together and that is out today and, you know, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts and on YouTube as well. So it's kind of, it was, it was originally a podcast in season one. And then after the success of that, then turned into, for season two, it was mainly focusing on human wildlife challenges but then it was also a podcast and being filmed at the same time. So you got the visuals to accompany it as well, which is, yeah, which is really cool. What can we expect from yeah. that then, watching and listening? Any insights to whet the appetite? Mm. Yeah. And, and, and working with Gordon was great as well, because, I mean, he's obviously, it, it, for those who don't know Gordon Buchanan, he's one of the world's most respected wildlife cameramen, and he's, He's got this incredibly empathetic approach to when he chats to people and it, he was definitely the right guy for the job for this one. And I think it was, again, it was an amazing project to be involved with because you're with conservation. Often you're hearing from those incredibly knowledgeable individuals who run the conservancies and they run these locations. But again, it's from hearing from the people who live alongside and yeah, I mean, like, it, we had no end to, sh no shortages of people wanting to tell their stories. Like, because we, for the, talk about storyboarding and planning for these shoots, I mean, we had a, a local team who would go out very respectfully into the um, communities and, and you'd have to speak to the, the um, Paramount Chiefs and then you'd have to go down and like do the do the process properly and then we speak to the chiefs and say do you have anyone who has wants to discuss these issues and so many people came forward yeah and had some unbelievable individuals who despite going through such tough times with run-ins with elephants or lions or hippos you know that they're, they're, it was their mindset that i took away the ability to still see the and, and no one's told them to how it should be this is how it's always been for them is that they sort of often a lot of the individuals we met view themselves as guardians of the wildlife they're part of it and despite having lost various things in terms of livelihoods or injuries or what have you they remained that kind of stewardship level was just incredible really yeah yeah, there were some really nice pieces on your Instagram page, page as well around some of the individuals and stuff. I'd recommend people go and check out as well and give you a follow. <clears throat> yeah, I'm excited to watch yeah. that. Good. Yeah, Good. definitely. Yeah, so can I want to be a bit respectful of your time? Well, you've kind of been on for about an hour now. Oh, <laughs> I can oh great. I can talk to you, talk to you all day about, about this stuff, but the last thing you need me is just pick, picking your brains constantly. So, but so what's kind of, have you got any unreal, unrealized adventures or films in the works or things that you would like to do, big ambitions? Oh, unrealized. Oh, there, there were so many. I'm saying this um, to the guy that's captured a snow leopard, that not many, which we didn't really yeah. touch on actually, which for, forgive me, that was pretty epic in its own. No, no, it's fine. No, it's fine. No, again, that was, that's pretty cool. Yeah. But the, yeah, no, there, there are quite a few things in the pipeline at the moment, which I will be excited to share at some point soon. But uh, yeah, I, oh, that's, that's, that's a really good question. Look, do you know what? I'd, one day I'd love to do a proper piece on the Isle of Man, actually, you know, oh, with yeah. its wildlife and it's very, very bringing it home that's not as exciting as perhaps we'd hoped there so there's like, a much well, wildlife wild. human wildlife challenges slash conflict with no, no, these four horns not, not a <laughs> piece but more just a, wild, yeah. a sort of wildlife piece there but no, I, no yeah and there's nothing there's plenty of ideas madcap ideas but yeah, yeah. I'll have to, you'll have to come back to me on that one. <laughs> Any plans to be in front of the camera? Um, well, if someone points the camera by <laughs> way, I might bumble a few words or whatever, but I really love 
the time, like g- giving the individuals and their yeah the world the the time. You know, no one wants to hear a monksman gas on for <laughs> hours on it. Oh, well, you never know. You, you never know. You're doing a good job so far on the tour and today. Excellent. So, two closing traditions early on the show. One of which is a paid forward suggestion. So, to raise awareness of any good causes, charities. You've been involved in quite a, a few uh, great projects, but. And then a call to adventure, which we'll come to. So what would your recommendation be for a pay it forward? Pay it forward. So yeah, I was having a think about this. So obviously we've touched on that. There's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to name, but there, obviously we talked about the 10% fence plan with Salvo and Tafauti. So yeah, to, if you check out there, really, that is, it's not a, a thing where you're sending your money away to go somewhere like i could guarantee tell you that this money is just going just into the most incredible cause that you that generally i mean so many there are so many good causes around the world that does incredible things and this particular one i've just seen it with my own eyes so i'd recommend like checking them out and yes yeah, Sabo trust and to Fauti. and then there's another one i just wanted to quickly mention is a buddy of mine darren Edwards is going to, he's, yeah, he wings for life. He is attempting later on in the year to go the furthest distance ever on a sit ski, which initially I believe was 111 kilometers. And he's punching for the 333 kilometers on a sit ski. So check out his page. It's an amazing He's an amazing guy, and it's an incredible charity. He has so. indeed. Yeah, he's done some fantastic stuff. Yeah. Uh, and yes, yeah. Yeah, Wing. fantastic. Wing. Wings for life, yeah. Wings for life. Excellent. So we'll get those listed in, in the show notes and as part of the, the marketing pack that comes out with us. We'll get it splashed on all the socials and stuff as well. Excellent. And a call to adventure. What would you say as a man who has travelled to some of the wildest and remotest places chased by hippos and, and all sorts and four horned sheep what would you say yeah my, my call for adventure is something that i'm doing it's more of a like personal it's, it, it's more of something that i'm going to try and do myself a bit more so this is more of a call to adventure for myself as well but this year i want to try and spend more time when you can on our local coasts and kind of l- local environments and really getting, I, I want to do more foraging this year, just yeah. like understanding seasons a bit more, slowing down. Because I mean, the, what I've realized is one of the, my favorite parts of the job is those moments of trying to capture when nature just slows everything down. And so getting those moments out on our own coastlines, on our own hills, and yes, yeah, spending time just, that's why foraging I love, because you're understanding the seasons and you're seeing what you can gather forage on our own doorstep and it, it's a cool thing so yeah i'm going to try and do that a bit more and i encourage people to check it out themselves excellent excellant do you cook much then you plan to forage and terrible. Cook? yeah terrible cook <laughs> I, I love you know <laughs> trying to get beyond just eating the leaves and actually kind of want say something but yeah if you can get like a nice mackerel a and then fire. Little, yeah yeah oh sand fire a bit of sea beet and kind of get it all fried yeah. oh it's some amazing stuff just yeah. on our doorstep fantastic excellent thank you Ollie. i thoroughly enjoyed this uh, it's been really wonderful and i really do appreciate your time oh my absolute pleasure it's been a really fun afternoon chatting yeah, yeah. excellent so where can people follow along for ollie and keep in touch with all your projects that are that you've done to date and that are coming where can we find out more i, I hate to say it's probably the best thing is just to follow my instagram <laughs> which is the, the easiest way in these days. But yeah, Ollie underscore Pemberton on Insta, O-L-L-Y, not an I or an I. Excellent. And we'll get all that listed anyway when we publish it and we'll give links out to all those uh, films as well where people can go and watch. And I, I highly recommend that everyone does that because they're not like feature length. They're short and punchy and very impactful. So I would recommend that go and watch everything we've talked about today. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and thank you so much for having me and and good luck with uh, the rest of the season. It's great to be on the podcast. Excellent. Thanks, Ollie. Thanks, mate.
Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. For the show notes and further information, please visit adventurediaries.com slash podcast. And finally, we hope to have inspired you to take action and plan your next adventure, big or small, because sometimes we all need a little adventure to cleanse that bitter taste of life from the soul. Until next time, have fun and keep paying it forward. Are you on Instagram? If so, then please give Adventure Diaries a follow. The page is at Adventure Diaries underscore underscore or simply search Adventure Diaries Chris Watson and you'll find additional podcast content and adventure content too. So go and add me now on Instagram and I'll see you over there. Thank you.